So welcome to Church History. This is our first lesson. Tonight's really just an introduction. Uh, we're going to start maybe just going over not just the course requirements, but the understanding of the ages that we'll be studying, and then we'll dip our toe into the first of those ages. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the lessons and how the course is structured. Um, we're going to, again, do an introduction tonight, and uh, if you look at uh, slide two, you'll see uh, that the course is broken up into a series of ages by dates, and they're not equal times. They're just general periods of time. And there's a bunch of different ways to classify the ages in church history. So everybody has a different view of what when an age begins and ends, and it, it tends to move a hundred or so years. That's particularly true of the, what's called the Middle Ages, some break those up into three or four different groups of ages. Some keep them all in one category. But for the purposes of this course and our discussion, I'm going to use this kind of age classification, uh, which comes from a number of uh, sources that we've studied. Uh, so we're going to look at the Apostolic Age, which is the age from the birth of the church to the end of the last apostle. And then we're going to look at the early church fathers. And if you think about this, I kind of think of it as a relay. There's a handing off of a baton to a series of people. And there's a series of events that occur during that, that time of, of that group or period. And there's a particular thing that's happening or a theme that's happening. So in the early church father's age, there's a handoff from those that have walked with Christ have been taught by Christ, and now they're carrying forward the teaching. But if you think about it, it's like their mentors have left, their teachers have left. John's not around to answer questions anymore. And so in the early church father's age, there's a real struggle for what does it mean, what did they learn, and what does it mean, and how do you apply that in life? And so that occurs, that may go from 1 to 200, may go as long as 300 A.D., but certainly the... the, the uh, uh, the critical period is the next century. Uh, and then we'll have the early Middle Ages. And again, that number shifts from, it can start as early as 200. There's no sign where you wake up in the morning and the newspaper reads, we've now entered the early Middle Age period. Uh, in fact, you'll see that when we get to the last age, which is postmodernism. We're in an age that has no real beginning. There's a general argument about when postmodern, the postmodern age begins whether we're actually in it or not, but we're in an age that's still being defined. And so it's sometimes difficult to define. This is the day it began, and this is the day it ended. It's more of a time period and a general theme uh, than the Middle Ages. And the reason why those are broken up is because there are events that occur in what we call the early Middle Ages that are separate and need to be looked at uh, specific, and there's a formation and an impact as it relates to church history that's a focal point in those early Middle Ages, and then the Middle Ages themselves where it takes root and carries forward. And that's the longest period of time in the ages we'll call the Middle Ages. That'll be a, a thousand year period of time where something takes root and gathers together and goes forward. And then we'll get to the period called the Reformation, which will be a shorter period of time, and that'll be in response, generally thought of as in response to the Middle Ages. So the, there's, and, and you could actually see this occurring. Something happens, it takes root, it goes on for a period of time, and then there's a change in thought or a process, and that's generally in response to the prior age. So you have to always look at what's happening. You have to look at it in the context of what's just happened. It actually determines what's happening. You'll be able to see that when we look at our current age. A lot of our thinking and a lot of what we view and how we view it is a direct response to the period before us called modernism or, or the modern era. And because of that, that's a response to the Reformation. And so we have these periods of time where we're constantly uh, being influenced by the period of time before us. And we may think we're completely independent, radical thinkers on our own. Yet, I'm going to show you throughout these periods of time that there's a subtle underlying element that's responsive to what's occurred. And when you look at it, you go, oh, that's why we think that way. Or, oh, that's why I, I think about things that way. Because we've been influenced by this, this never-ending train of 
historicity and, and, and this ongoing element of evolution and thinking, really. Think about that. There's an evolutionary period here. We're evolving in how we're thinking about things. Uh, finally, uh, the Reformation leads to the modern age, and then uh, what we'll call the postmodern age. Again, uh, great debate on the dates. Don't focus on the dates. Uh, uh, we can argue about when they begin and when they end, but there are periods of time, and there are clear differences in those periods, and that's what we're going to focus on and we'll look at. So a lot of, uh, a lot of words up there that may look like uh, nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Uh, that may be a problem in a seminary. <laughs> And you go, why are we studying it? Because this is the entire history of the church. And the only thing that we're going to be focused on in this period of time is we're going to be focused on what is the church doing in this period of time? Not what's going on politically or, or historically as it relates to humanity, although we'll have to deal with that because it has an impact and an influence. And Christ is intertwined. His influence is intertwined in what happens in the world. So we want to watch that, and we want to learn from it, but this isn't a world history class or a European history class. This is a Christ history class. This is the history of the church, okay? All right, any questions on that? Of course, as always, then we have a final exam, which you're well familiar with, and we'll ace as you normally do. And then we'll head to uh, the course requirements. So in order to complete this course, we have two simple things now, so we're down to two. You don't have weekly review sessions or homework. You don't have to go through that. Uh, I will prepare you for the final exam before you take it. Uh, so I'll put out a review process for you for the final exam. That'll be the week before the final exam. I will send you something. Here are the takeaways to look at. Uh, read this. This will prepare you for the test. Okay. And then uh, the essay requirement, uh, this should be a fun one, an easy one. Um, this is one that's meant for you to think about the influence or the, um, the where the church is today and compare it to where the church was in the apostolic age. And we're going to talk about the apostolic age tonight, the first hundred years. And the reason why I want you to compare it is because we have a tendency to idealize the apostolic age. It is the perfect church. Everything else is less than the apostolic age. Why? Because the apostles walk with Christ, right? So that must have been the perfect church, and everything after that was less than that. And so I want you to look at, honestly look at the apostolic age, and then I want you to look at the church today and make honest comparisons to both the things that were right and wrong in the apostolic age and the things that are right and wrong today and what can we learn from them. And the point of it is not to be critical but to learn from it. What, what happened in the apostolic age with the church that went well? What happened in the apostolic age didn't go well and don't mean didn't go well as it relates to there weren't 3,000 people in the seats and the church was growing in size. It became a mega church. It, I don't mean it that way. I mean in terms of the spread of the gospel. How effective was it as in its primary mission? Okay, so that's the essay requirement. So uh, once we get through the apostolic age, which is tonight and next week, you can start writing your essay. Because <laughs> you can start thinking about, here's the apostolic age. Here, is the thing, here are my observations about the apostolic age. And now, here are my observations about the church today. You should be able to hand this essay in in August. Fair? Okay, I see you're all nodding your heads and in complete and utter agreement with that and happy. You're just so happy about that. Oh, you did see that requirement. Okay, that's a good point, Allie. It says, essay due and no later than September 6th. So now, because we're preparing for graduation, deadlines matter. They always matter, but they matter a lot now. I can't get your grades in. You can't get your degree unless I get your paperwork to grade, okay? So we have a hard date of the first week of September, where if you have outstanding work, you need to get it to me now, quickly. And then as we're getting that done, the work that's due, this, these two courses, you need to get it done by that date, okay? And you will, I promise you, you will, okay? Um, but you have the opportunity on the essay to start now. 
and then we just have a final exam. Okay. All right. So I pretty much have one, just one or two slides for tonight as we talk about um, those complicated ages and the dates. Are you guys ready for the test? We'll take the test right now. Like when's the Reformation age? Give me the date range. And no. Okay. All right. Well, I had a different question. Nice. Was it? Yeah, buddy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a hundred right there on that test. Yeah. Right. I got a different question. Why should we even study this? Why should we study church history? What do we hope to gain from it? See where we were. See where we are. Compare their mistakes with our mistakes and try and make it better. See where we were as a church, I assume. See where we are as a church. And how to make it better. I like that. Okay. Any other reasons to study it? For prophecy. Prophecy. That's a great one. Actually, I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, sure. Uh, there's no question that to understand what God has told us will occur and what is going to occur, we get a chance to verify that really. Um, and, and understand that better. So, okay, I like that answer. Any other ones? It's the same thing as us understanding and being able to look at the writings in the time frame to really understand what those things meant at the time that they were happening instead of taking our look at what it is. So, so I agree with all of what you've said, um, but as it relates to studying history, uh, history is a very specific subject. History is um, is a is a record of events, right? And actually, there's an interesting topic about how you kind of go back and reimagine what had happened, right? But but from a, a purely academic standpoint, history is about um, going back and trying to understand the occurrence of the events in as truthful or as factual a manner as possible. Okay, well, so that's interesting as you think about the church because there are many today who would actually even deny the historicity of Jesus Christ. So, uh, in fact, that occurred um, even around the time of Christ or shortly after the time of Christ. There were uh, two general historians that, that we rely on from an early age that give us a, a view of what's occurring at that time. One is Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian. And the other is Tacitus. He's a Roman historian. And they both confirm the historicity, meaning he was a real person. He was a real historical person. Um, but there are some who would deny that, that it was a myth made up. That Christianity itself is a myth made up, or, or the events surrounding Christ's life are a myth made up that are kind of expanded upon by their believers, by those that followed Christ. And this is more generally the view of Christianity, is that Jesus was a good person, maybe a teacher. Now, you got to think about that for a second, right? So somebody who has actually never studied or looked at Christianity is willing to acknowledge, well, there's a lot of people who follow this guy, so he must have been a good teacher. I don't know a whole lot about him. I don't even know what he taught. But he must be a good teacher because everybody kind of follows him. They're willing to acknowledge that from a historical standpoint without any kind of uh, look at it, without any evidence of that. He could have been teaching like really bad things. But it didn't, wouldn't bother them to say, well, he must be a good teacher or a good person. I'll go that far. I've heard some things, you know, like love your neighbor and, you know, love everybody. So that sounds good. So he must be a good teacher, right? And so they'll go that far in the acknowledgement of the historical record of who Christ is. But that whole other stuff about what they said happened, you know, the whole death thing and then the resurrection thing, and then the miracles thing, those things. Oh, by the way, that whole God thing, 
about he, he claimed to be God and he came into the world, that whole historical event about that, that has to be put aside and dismissed because I just can't get my arms around it. So I propose to you that one of the reasons why we study church history, like we would study any other historical event, is to try to understand the truthfulness of what happened and then to study that around that. So that's so we would look at specifically the, the historicity, the truthfulness of the events surrounding Christ's life, and we're going to look at it in the birth of the church. We're going to look at it in the response that the church has to those events of Christ's life, because in our program here, we've spent a lot of time looking at the historical accuracy of the transmission of the scriptures, of the events surrounding Christ's life, but we're going to look at where it picks up from his resurrection and forward and what happens, and we're going to look and see for evidence historically of whether or not it was a myth, whether or not there's evidence of a myth that's occurring in the church, and is that myth being transmitted, because that's the general view of our faith outside of our faith. Well, it's just a bunch of people who made stuff up and kept, it kept, the lie kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The story kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Maybe it wasn't meant to be a lie. It was, you know, he died and they thought he was God and, and then their story about resurrection came about. They, somebody thought he saw him and they got that big, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger, right? That's the view. So I'm going to propose to you that when you study the historical facts, particularly of the early church, very difficult to believe that there's a myth in there. It's very hard to believe both from the records, particularly of the early church fathers, and the historical events that occur, that a lie got bigger. It's just very hard to believe that. And knowing that is another way to minister. Knowing that's another way to minister. One of the things that I hear as a comparator is today, well, uh, we, they, they would point to people who blow themselves up for faith, suicide bombers. And they'd say, well, they die for a lie. That's a, that's a term that's used, right? They die, for, they, they, don't, they die for a lie, so how's that any different? And that's a comparison often made to the early church. And the difference is this. Those today that would die for their faith are not, do not have direct knowledge of their faith like the first witnesses did. And so the apostolic age becomes really important in the test for the starting point of whether or not this is a myth or a historical event being transmitted forward, recorded and transmitted forward. Right? Because if they knew it was a lie, the events that we're going to see them go through, my guess is somebody's going to raise their hand and say, we made that up. Okay. So as we watch that, we're looking for evidence of that along the way. We're also looking for the evidence of things creeping into the transmission of the story. We're watching the behavior that occurs as a result of the transmission of the of historical events that occur in the first century. What happens when that event is told over and over again? What impact does it have uh, to people, to, to states, to governments, and to the world? Because it has a pretty extraordinary impact. How do people behave as a result of that? Rightly and wrongly. And I think we're going to be challenged by that. Because we're going to see some things that we're going to have to deal with. Right? The using the name of Christ in a way that doesn't glorify God, but ends up causing uh, great uh, dishonor in the use of Christ's name. Uh, or for personal gain, or for political gain. Uh, so let's be honest about that as we walk through and look at and look for those things. Because when we're telling about a historical event and what happens as a result of that, we also want to be honest about other historical events that occur along the way. Fair? Okay. All right. So my only other slide for tonight is this slide. And this is a timeline of the apostolic age. And so we start with the apostolic age begins here at the birth of the church at Pentecost. So um, I don't have time tonight. I, I promise you a separate time. We'll, 
unwind the birth date of Christ. Um, but um, the dating occurs later. And the question was, is the setting of the zero line right? And it appears there was an issue or a problem. Now, some think there was an issue or a problem. Some think that there's not. Okay? And so there's a specific challenge in that dating of whether Christ is born, where we would set the Adonodomine, the year of the Lord, at the one line, or whether we should, it should have been set back four or five years. Uh, so, but let's not deal with that now, because we'll spend an hour on that. Um, just know that there is a time where Christ is born. And that's really the timeline that everything else is measured off of. By the way, how cool is it, from a humanity standpoint, that we literally measure time by when Jesus came into the world? And I, I often point this out to my friends, particularly my non-believing friends, that, yeah, the stuff that you know, we're talking about really isn't that important. We only measure time by it, you know, which is actually appropriate because he's the author of time. So we should use him as the, as the measuring point, right? So, um, okay, so um, uh, Augustus, so why Roman emperors, right? Because sometimes we have to look at what's going on in the world. By the way, that's how we date things. We measure against what's going on in the world and the, and the point in scripture where uh, a, a, an emperor is mentioned gives us a time frame historically for us to understand what, when we're dealing with things, okay? But by the way, this is 2,000 years ago, well, more than 2,000 years ago, and we don't know sometimes when the Roman side has the right time frame, okay? Because those records are 2,000 years old. And I want to point that out because we make the assumption that those records are sitting somewhere, clean and clear and easy to read, and all we need to do is go to the Roman library and open it up and flip back a few pages. There were no pages. There were no books. So... The historical record that's taken um, as it relates to the gospel and, and the records that happened, particularly in the early church fathers, we have more. They appear to be much more accurate um, and much better preserved, meaning we have more copies of them. We have more evidence of them. We can reconstruct them better. And so uh, I have more confidence in the fact that Jesus Christ was a human who walked the earth than I do than Julius Caesar having walked the earth. Because the records and the evidence for him are far greater that Jesus Christ was a, a human who walked the earth. There's far greater evidence for that. In fact, there's a, one of my kind of favorite professors, and here's where I shuffle through papers to try to find a quote, is a guy named F.F. F. Bruce who is uh, Ryland's professor of biblical criticism and exegesis at the University of Manchester, he says, some writers toy with the fancy of a Christ myth, uh, but they do not do so on the grounds of historical evidence. Uh, particularly, it seems to have been high season over the last hundred years to even call into the question whether or not Christ was real as, as a human historical person. So F.F. F. Bruce says, the historicity of Christ is as axiomatic for an unbiased historian as the history of Julius Caesar. Uh, if you're going to believe Julius Caesar's alive, you've got to accept that Jesus Christ is alive. Okay? That's from a historical standpoint, not from a, just from a faith standpoint. Okay. So, uh, so I need to, so we have some, 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 uh, comparative points from a timeline standpoint. Um, the Roman Emperor, so Rome is in charge, but it's in a bit of chaos. <clears throat> Rome was a republic, and coming out of the republic, we have a guy named Julius Caesar who is moving the Roman Republic, and I'm not a Roman historian, so I'll get all of this wrong, I'm sure. Uh, but he's moving the Republic towards uh, a monarchy or, or a dictatorship. And we know the story about him being betrayed and killed, um, but there's treachery going on in Rome. In fact, 
Roman emperors don't last so long. Okay? And so uh, after Julius Caesar's death, a guy named Octavius takes over, and he claims the heir to Caesar's title and moves. Actually, the way he takes over is kind of interesting because he's asked to take over. He, it, it happens in such a politically savvy way that he becomes kind of the guy that everybody wants to take over. And then he takes that and uses that to basically kill the Republic. And he becomes, he takes the title called Caesar Augustus. So he's the high ruler. He's fully in charge. Okay, so Rome is the last kind of great empire that we've seen roll through the scriptures. It's gone from the Egyptians to the Assyrians to the Babylonians to the Medo-Persians to the Greeks. And then from the Greeks, just before Christ's time, about 50 years before, 44 years before Christ, the Romans take over. So Alexander is running through Europe and taking over everything. And then he dies. He conquers the world and dies quickly. And there are four heads that fight it out. And then out of that comes the Roman Empire. And we have this kind of this remnant of chaos and confusion after a world conqueror has taken over the world, and that gets consolidated again. And now we have this power sitting in Rome. And why is that important as it relates to church history? Because the world's been conquered. <laughs> and inside of the world is this kingdom called Jerusalem, or Israel. Okay, And so they're, they're subjugated to the ruling power of the day. Uh, there's a Greek background, not so far ago, but there's a ruling Roman Empire. And that ruling Roman Empire is really the power of the day. And so we have to keep that in mind, okay? Um, we're pretty familiar with the events of Christ's life, his baptism, his ministry, three years, just to remind you. Um, crucifixion, and ascension, and then the birth of the church. So we start really the apostolic age with the birth of the church and the power of the Holy Spirit coming in. And we studied Acts 2 when we looked at kind of the, our, our walk through the Gospels and, we, and the historical events recorded in Acts 2, in Acts in general, and the birth of the church. So here's where we start to idealize the church. It's filled with power. There's great miracles. We look at the stories that are occurring. The gospel's spreading everywhere. Everybody's receiving the gospel. What's the next thing on the list? Somebody dies. Oh, Jack, right. Jesus died. Not, no. The next thing on the list after the birth of the church. Holy Spirit comes oh. in. The church is filled with power. Things are going great. We've got power in the church. There's miracles. Acts 2 says, and, and thousands came, and they shared everything, and they're happy, right? Why is Stephen dying? Oh, okay. Something I have to tell you about the Apostolic Age. Um, it wasn't so great. Uh, because here's what happens, okay? So there's a bunch of different kind of groups that are going on. There are... Uh, there are Jewish believers. Uh, there's uh, Greek believers. We call them Hellenists. Okay? There are Jews who are Orthodox in their faith, in their view. Uh, they, they say, we follow Abraham. And then there are Romans. Romans, Jews, Christians. They're not called Christians yet. Okay? They're, in fact, the general view of the faith was they were a sect of Judaism at this point. They're just Jews who believe Messiah has come. Okay, now from a Jewish standpoint, that would be heretical. Uh, it would be a sect of Jews who got it wrong. Not Christians yet. Just a sect of Jews who got it wrong. They've got the Messiah wrong. Okay. There is a dispute that occurs, and we see this in Acts, and actually Acts lays out these elements here. But there's a dispute that occurs and as a result of that, Stephen is martyred. And 
Hellenist or Greek believing or Greek uh, oriented uh, background Jew uh, Christians are actually dispelled or or spewed out. They're chased out. They're persecuted. They're chased out of Jerusalem. Okay, Holy Spirit's power in the church, presence in the church. Everything's going great. We're sharing everything. God's working in us. What do you mean we got to leave? They have to leave. And they didn't just go from Jerusalem up the street. They left the country. This is where the first part of the spread of the gospel begins to occur. They move to places like Antioch. And in fact, when we see Paul going to Antioch, it's because Barnabas has already been there with other Hellenist believers who have already begun to establish churches outside of Jerusalem. All right? So those churches existed not because Paul formed them. He's joining churches that have already been there. That gets to a quick uh, dispelling of the notion of Paul. Paul's actually becoming a believer at about this time. He's going to go away for a couple years, and, and the Lord's going to work and minister in him. While that's happening, the Lord's already sent out, spewed out, Believers, he's done it under persecution. They're running for their lives. Some have died already. Okay, We had a conversation tonight about comfort and the idea of being physically comfortable. There is nothing comfortable about what's happening in the apostolic age to the church because generally speaking, the furtherance of the gospel happens under persecution. Because it's clear to see the difference between, this is, you see this when Paul preaches, difference between riots and revivals. You see that almost everywhere else where the gospel is being brought because it brings to light what happens in the darkness. And the darkness doesn't just sit there and say, well, that's a really good idea. Thanks for turning the light on. It reacts to it. And God allows that stirring in order for the gospel to continue to spread. Now, he's protecting and he's keeping those as he needs them to be. But there are clear martyrs dying for the witness and the faith of, of, of the message of Jesus Christ. They're occurring starting with, with, um, with Saul. Okay, uh, starting with Stephen. We have Saul's conversion... Okay, now, if we thought there were, like, really bad guys in charge of Rome, it goes from really bad to very, 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 very bad. Okay, so we go, uh, we get a guy named Caligula in 37 to 41 AD, and he causes, he begins persecution in Jerusalem itself, beheads James, the brother of, John, uh, uh, yeah, James, the brother of John is beheaded in Jerusalem. So now, Jewish believers are beginning to be persecuted uh, by uh, both Roman rulers and now we're going to start to see some conflicts with Jewish uh, Pharisees. Um, Paul begins his journeys in the 50s, just to give you a sense of the timeline here. The first meeting of the Council of Apostles occurs around 50. It is, so you see it's 20 years since Christ is gone. Uh, what do you notice about the structure of the church right now? I mean, the Pope's been put in place, cathedral's been built, uh, the gathering every Sunday. None of that's happening, right? Yeah, actually, they're not gathering, uh, generally speaking, out in the open often, because if you're a Hellenist a believer, That'd be a bad thing to do. It'd be like saying, please run me out of town. If you're a Jewish believer, you may be attending synagogue, but you're certainly not standing up in the synagogues and, and, and proclaiming. You may be, but actually one of the things that's going to cause a break between Christians and Jews is the idea of being thrown out of the synagogues. So worship in on Saturdays in the synagogues for Christians are becoming difficult. By the way, the term Christian is first used in Antioch, and it's a derogatory term. So the believers that are spewed out 
are seen as Christ followers, disciples of Christ, and it's used as a way to label them, oh, those are those Christians. Not a good term. Okay, but it's used in Antioch, outside of Jerusalem. They've already been thrown out of one place. They're getting thrown out of many places. Uh, well, Caligula was just a warm-up to Nero. Uh, we get to Nero, and uh, things go from very, 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 very bad to as unimaginably bad as we can get. Um, so there's a story. Um, it's still debated about the, kind of the accuracy of the story. But the story of Nero in uh, this age is um, a fire breaks out. So Nero wanted to rebuild the, um, the emperor's estates, and he wanted to rebuild them in a Greek style rather than in whatever style they were in. And so he had a lot of construction going on. He was spending a lot of money. And there was um, a lot of anxiety about that. There was a lot of anxiety amongst the people being taxed so much. And a fire breaks out. There's a question about who or how the fire begins. Uh, but it destroys a lot of the buildings that are underway. And it destroys some of the, uh, the area that's um, in the Christian and the Jewish quarters. And as a result of the fire... Uh, and the money that's already been consumed on the construction, Nero really has a choice to make. Uh, my bad, wasted all that money. Or he can do what he did, apparently, which was blame the Christians, who are already being viewed as a troublemaking sect in uh, the area. And so Nero blames the Christians, and in fact takes the public anger and turns it from him onto Christians and says, they're the problems, it's just their problems. Now, the Jews actually saw this as um, <clears throat> a way to look at Christians and say, the reason why we're being persecuted, the reason why God is punishing us, is because they're pointing to the false proclamation of who Messiah is. And they're saying the Christians are actually bringing persecution on the Jews, and so the Christians are a problem. So there are three actors in this period of time, three groups in this period of time. And what's ending up happening is first the Christians are being looked at as the reason for blame and there's persecution. Now, the persecution is generally going to be seen, and we'll spend time in more detail on this probably in next week, but there are ten periods of great persecution in the uh, Apostolic Age and the Early Church Age, and Nero kicks off the first, what's looked at as the first of ten great periods of persecution. But his periods of persecution are likely what uh, results in Paul and Peter's martyrdom. Uh, it results in Christians being um, used, dipped in wax, and used as candles in his garden. Uh, they are, uh, he would put, uh, he would have animal skins put on the Christians and sent out into the garden so wild packs of animals would eat them. Um, and he did it for sport and for fun. And he did it to please the population. Uh, so there's a wicked period of time of persecution. Why, why is it that um, Christianity is being se separated and looked at differently? Okay, so Rome's policy of uh, conquering a people, there are different views in how the world powers would handle some place that they taken over. Rome's policy was we'll take your beliefs and your systems and we'll integrate it into ours. This policy is called syncretism. So uh, what's the best way for us to get you to go along with us? Why don't you tell us what you believe and what you like, and we'll add that to the common beliefs. Okay? As long as we agree that you uh, recognize Caesar or emperor as the final authority and say, in fact, you need to uh, either it'll get to ultimately worship of, of Caesar as a test of loyalty, right? So this is why you have the pantheon of gods, the temples that would happen in both Greece and Rome. You have a, basically a collection of gods. Which god do you want? Do you want the bird god? Do you want the sun god? Whatever it is, here's how we're going to get the people to come together. 
slight problem with those kind of pesky people in Israel, those Jews who refuse to be accepted in and, and become part of a, 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 a temple of a whole bunch of gods. Why? Because in Deuteronomy 6, it says, I'm, your Lord, your, I'm the Lord your God. You'll have no other gods before me. Uh, there's only one God for Judaism. So they refuse to accept this. And Rome makes an exception. It says, okay, we're still in charge. You can keep your one God. But there's tension between those two. Christianity is an extension of that. And they get basically the same extension that Judaism gets. The same extension, right? And so that extension is, okay, you're Jews. You're not Christians. You're just a sect of Judaism. And so you get the same ex exception as long as you agree to worship the emperor. Now that's going to get very real after this. But for now, it's the emperor is in charge. He's the real God on earth. And, but we'll give you this exemption because we really don't want to feel like wiping you out. That's really the, the, the trade-off that Rome is making. That exception's about to expire. In the 60s, here, uh, he not, uh, uh, when Rome burns, Nero declares Christianity legal throughout the empire. Now everybody's on the run. Every Christian's on the run. But shortly after that period of time, there's a war that's been brewing anyway between the Jews and Rome over Jerusalem. And now in Jerusalem, there's an actual war in 66. And so there's an issue with the temple tax, and there's an issue with taxes in general, and there's a really high unemployment rate, and the Jews say no more, and they go to war. And Titus comes, who's a general at the time, he'll be an emperor soon, but he comes and lays siege to Jerusalem. And the Jews think that the Christians are going to side with them. And instead, the Christians effectively say, we're not about a sovereign nation. We're about a sovereign God. And they split, physically split. And from a Judaism standpoint, this is the break between Judaism and Christianity. It is no longer a sect. There is an absolute outright hatred. And so they're broken apart. What happens next is Rome comes in, takes the city, and destroys the temple. Look what happens in 40 years. Okay? In 40 years from Christ's ascension to this moment, the place that you would go, that God plants, that tells Abraham, I'm going to give you a place, and it's going to be a witness and testimony to who I am on earth, the place that he gives them to, the place that David goes to, that Solomon builds the temple on, the place is gone. It's gone the moment Christ comes into the world. You want historical facts? You can't plan this if you wanted to. If you wanted to say that God came into the world and he said that thing is going to go, that temple, that everybody comes once a year and visits because they want to visit the presence of God, the presence of God is now in each one of you. If that story were a myth, you can't plan what happens next. Somehow engineer a war <laughs> between two other factions, and the end result of the war is the destruction of the temple and the expulsion of Jews from Jerusalem. You couldn't plan that, because it's not Christians involved at all. And it's exactly what Christ had said was going to occur. Right? So, so we see in the apostolic age, your point about prophecy before is right on. But we also see that the events that are occurring validate exactly what we're seeing, uh, what should occur. Because what God said is, now I've come to be with you because the sacrifice of my son allows for the reconciliation in the world in a way where you don't have to visit me in a temple anymore. You don't have to come to see my presence. I'm coming to dwell with you. And I'm getting rid of temple-centric worship. We should 
Think about that from a ministry standpoint. We think about one hour a week where I visit a temple. That's what churches have become, temple-centric worship. I had a conversation with my son the other day, and I asked him about just where he was at, and he said, he said, good, I'm in a good place, and you know, I haven't been able to get to church. And, and I said, I'm not about that one hour a week. It's about where you are with God, right? This is where we get temple-centric worship from. I have to go to see God. I have to go to be with God. And what God has done is come into the world and destroyed that in this age. And then he sent everybody out. He said, look, I don't want anybody coming here anymore. You can come here, but I'm sending them out to tell you about me. I'm sending everybody out. And so that's exactly what happens is there's persecution and spewing out of the apostles into the world so that the gospel's carried out. The apostolic age technically ends at the death of John because he's the last apostle alive. So that's, that's a date that we go, okay, when he dies, that's the end of this age. Right? So, um, but that doesn't end the story that's happening here. What's happening is people are being sent out from Jerusalem. Antioch and other places, Syria become the areas, uh, uh, Asia Minor, Macedonia become the central areas of the church now. Jerusalem does not because of this, this shift in this transition. And as a result of that, we have the beginning, the first steps of the gospel spreading into the world, the good news spreading into the world. But you really have to kind of think about that spread. It doesn't happen the way I would imagine it. It doesn't happen where Christ has come in and God's power has been given to us and we're told with authority what to do. Go bring the good news to all the nations. That's the commandment that Jesus gives us. And I go, well, sounds good. I'm going to go climb in my car and drive up the street and go give the good news, right? That isn't how that's happening here. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. It's done in clear guidance and direction to God. And it's done in a way that I would imagine if I'm one of the ministers in the apostolic age, I would be yelling and screaming to God, God, where are you? Where's the kind of the band of protection? Where is the area of help that I would be expecting? Now, there are all kinds of miracles that are happening in this time because there is complete, not, well, not complete, there is submission that's occurring to the, to the direction and the mission that Jesus Christ has given. There's submission to that. As a result of that, there's power being given into the church. Question for you this week is, why does it have to be this way? Why did God do it this way? Why not the easy way? Why not the comfortable way? There's an answer. I'm just not going to give it to you this week. I want you to think about it. Amen? Amen. All right. Will you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, you know, because you made each one of us, that we would prefer comfort and we would prefer convenience. And our self, Lord, will often get in the way of the selfless mission, Lord, that you have for us. But we ask this week that you would reveal to us, Lord, the areas of comfort and convenience that are not of you that serve no purpose for you, that simply serve the purpose of feeding ourselves. And that, Lord, that you would reveal that to us so that we would be able to, Lord, just get rid of it in our lives. Lord, it's frightening at times for me to hear that there might be, perse that, not that there might be, that there will be persecution, Lord, and suffering and, 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 and discomfort, Lord, in serving you, Lord. So, Lord, I ask that you give us courage, Lord, knowing, Lord, that uh, you send us out, Lord, as, as sheep into wolves, Lord. So protect us, Lord. But send us out anyway, Lord. Send us out when, when, when you're asking whom shall you send, Lord, let our hearts cry out, send us. Here I am, Lord, send us. 
and, and send us, Lord, for your glory and for your honor and for your purpose, Lord. And we don't even need to understand why that is. Just give us the courage, Lord, to hear your voice, to surrender to it and to faithfully follow it, Lord. Lord, and we ask, Lord, that you'd be glorified and honored in it, as you have been throughout the history of your church that you would receive the glory and honor rightfully due the God of all creation who comes into the world so that you would save it, Lord. Thank you for that. Lord, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, that you would even consider us worthy, Lord, to know you and to be part of you and let alone be used by you. So, Lord, we thank you. And we praise your holy, true, and awesome name, Lord. In your, in your Son and our Savior's name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen.